So if I have, let's talk about strain here. If I have some body that's um, in some reference configuration X and it goes over to some new deformed configuration U of X, I can define a couple things. I can define the main one being uh, a deformation gradient. Gradient, which is a measure of the the rough the the total, def uh, the total deformation of this thing, the the rate of the or the relative change of the deformation within the body. So my deformation gradient f, I'm going to define as um, i plus gradient of u. <coughs> so this f is non-symmetric. Uh, it's just kind of comes out of the calculation here. Um, and it's we're, we're defining this quantity, this strain gradient here, from our, def or our deformation gradient. For our deformation gradient, we can calculate the finite strain, which we take as a value e, which is different than our Young's modulus. It just happens to be e, which is a vector because of that underlying symbol, uh, is going to be f transpose f. Uh, minus i. So this is sort of similar to uh, the, the infinitesimal strain gradient, but now for any arbitrary deformation and for large strains. So if we multiply this guy out, uh, this ends up being gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose plus gradient of u transpose gradient of u so here, this this gradient of u uh, is a is a first order term. Yep. Yesterday you, you have a factor of one half. I did. Thank you. There should be a half out here. Um, good catch. Uh, so here, these these u terms are on the order uh, first order. Here, these gradient of u times this gradient of u times gradient of u is a second order. So, for small strain, as long as my my deformation relative is, is relatively small, so on the order of maybe a couple percent strain, um, I can ignore this higher order term, and I can get an infinitesimal strain. Infinitesimal strain which I'm going to go back to my little e, which should be familiar, uh, is then equal to just these lower order terms. One half gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose. So this is a very general definition of strain. Here we're, we're defining this starting from a deformation gradient, going to a finite strain. So this is true for any and all strains that are applied to the body and moving to a small strain, our infinitesimal strain, which is only true for small strains on the body. Um, and this is our nice engineering approximation because we're engineers and we like to ignore higher order terms because they make things complicated. Um, so now let's actually look at some examples of how this guy works. So if I take uh, a uniaxial tension of a bar, so Let's look at, I'm going to start with maybe a box. And I'm going to deform this to, let's say this is some original length L, L, L on all sides here. So this is a, a cube. This then gets stretched out. I'm going to grossly exaggerate the deformation here. Um, after pulling this guy out, this is going to turn into some uh, lambda L. This, uh, which example do I want to do? So when I pull this out, you know that based on based on the Poisson's ratio of a material, it's going to contract in here on the sides. So the relative contraction here would be our L minus uh, BL. 
that how I want to do this? I don't want to do it that way. I can actually erase things now. Hey, hey. Thanks, Amelia. Um, let's do this a different way. So, let's say I want this body to have to to be volume conserving. So, I want the volume of this body to be a constant. So, originally, this volume is L L L. Now. When I deform it, my new L, my new X, L in the X direction, let's define a coordinate system, that would probably help, X, Y, Z. Um, my new X here is a lambda L, then I have some L, Y, L, Z is still equal to that same constant. This is now for a volume conserving body. So that means if I deform it, the volume stays the same. Uh, here, if I were to, to multiply this out, this is just an L cubed is equal to that constant. Uh, Ly, I'm going to assume equals to L is equal to Lz, which is then this uh, one over the square root of lambda. Do, do, do. One over the square root of lambda. So is that too small? Sorry, L. L over the square root of lambda. Thank you. So now these contract in to be one over the square or to the L over the square root of lambda. So this is sort of like a Poisson's ratio, but for a volume conserving body. Uh, does anybody know what value Poisson's ratio that would correspond to? might be a little bit more of a, an out there question. So for a body with a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.5, that's actually a volume conserving body. So that means, so most, most metals, are, plastics are around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 Poisson's ratio. Um, if you have a Poisson's ratio of 0.5, that's actually, if you stretch it, the volume stays the same. And there's a few materials that actually satisfy that. One of the most common are, are rubbers, elastomers, have a Poisson's ratio pretty close to 0.5, it's like 0.49, uh, and cork. Cork actually also has a Poisson's ratio right around 0.5. So if I took rubber and I stretched it out, the volume would actually stay the same. So this now, uh, L over square root lambda, and the same for this one. Uh, this means now my u, uh, how do I want to do this? Yes, my u of x is equal to, so if I start at a point L, I end up with lambda x, y over square root lambda, and z over square root lambda. So this is now, whoops, the relative stretches of the body. So the relative deformation. If I start at a point L, I move over a point. Uh, I move over by a distance lambda. Then my strain correspondingly is um, the gradient of U plus gradient U transpose one half. Here, this gradient of U. Uh, did I actually write this out yesterday? Mm, possibly. Oh, yeah, what? Too many notes. Yeah. Yeah. So the. So here, uh, screw it. I'm just gonna write it the whole thing. This is a dux dx. So if I if I take the partial derivative, I don't want to write this out. Ah, I'm I'm just gonna write out this whole thing. Uh, one half du x dy plus du y dx plus uh, one half du x 
dz, du, z, dx, and it's kind of similar going through du, y, dy, du, z, dz. Ah, uh, this is a mess. Where do I want to roll back to? Yeah, I could just write it on any page. Mm, okay. Let's see. So, let's roll back. Strain gradient, one half, or sorry, infinitesimal strain, one half gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose. When I take the gradient of u, uh, this is my du dx, du, du x dx, du um, x dy. <laughs> Here, let's do this. The gradient of u is a matrix that we're writing out, so this is dux dx, dux dy, dux dz, du y, dx, du z, dx, uh, du z, dz, du y, dz, du y, dy, du z, dy. So this gradient operator, when I take the gradient of a vector, it pops out in this matrix. So when I take this strain gradient operator, when I take gradient of u plus the transpose of the gradient of u, or the, the yeah, then I end up with my strain being something bigger and uglier and more complicated, uh, dux dx, transpose of a matrix, yes, that is familiar, okay, um, so I take the, yeah, so you flip this along the diagonal here, so if I flip this along the diagonal and I add these two components, I end up, and I take the half of that, I end up with the same thing, if I flip it and I add these two together, I end up with one half, dux, dy, du, y, dx, <coughs> one half, dux, dz, du, z, dx, um, du, y, dy, du, z, dz, and the rest of these components out. Um, whatever, d one half, du, y, dz, du, z, dy. So now our our matrix is symmetric. So by adding the matrix, this matrix and the transpose that creates a symmetric matrix. So now our strain is symmetric, um, which makes things easier. So plugging in now for our uniaxially strained body. Do, do, do. Let's do some stretched out version of that. Where I have some u of x is getting stretched in the x direction, uh, y over square root lambda in this direction, z over square root lambda in the other direction. Um, then my strain gradient, I can take the derivative at each of these components, my strain gradient, my strain. Um, dux dx <laughs> is now just a lambda. Duy dy is now just a one over lambda. Uh, Duz dz is now also a one over lambda. What am I doing wrong here? 
Did I totally mess all of this up? I might have. Nope. <sighs> okay, that's why. Something seemed off. No? Why? Yes. That's why something is off. It's a good thing I can erase things now. Maybe. Ooh, that's kind of squeaky. Okay. Just went through this yesterday. You think I wouldn't be making mistakes? Okay, so here now, let's start kind of with the analysis that we did yesterday. We have some point zero zero coordinate system x y z. Um, this stays in the same coordinate system x y z. Now, if I if I stretch this body out, this goes to a new point lambda. Let's. Oh. Yeah, what? Is this not the erase bit? Oh yeah, no, we do All right. <laughs> Okay, this is, this is just going to be one of those days. Cool. Is this? Oh my gosh. That's a lot better. Was I, I was literally just rubbing the pen <laughs> mark off the paper. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, which coordinate system are we following? The one on the left or the right? Um, so this is the same. <sighs> Jeez. Well. Luckily now I can erase everything. Um, I'm I'm actually surprised that erased at all. <laughs> that was <sighs> okay. Okay, okay, we can do this. So uh, y z now. This body is getting stretched out by some value lambda. Um, so so a point here starting at zero is moving some distance lambda x. The body was originally up here, and it's now contracting. So my u of x is not actually what I had written before. So my my change in length, my my lx uh, nu is, is some lambda l if this body originally starts as an l by l by l cube. Um, my nu l width here is lambda l if this is bot if this is a volume conserving, then L Y is still L over square root lambda, which is equal to L Z. But now here, so I have all of my points in the X are moving out a lambda L. All of my points in the Y are actually moving in the negative direction, which was where my problem was negative square root lambda L, negative square root lambda L. There we go. So now, yes, I can. Sorry. This is, oh, look at that. Um, that's a negative out here. So now all these points in the X, uh, the Y and the Z are moving in. So this is now moving a, a negative lambda L distance. My strain gradient, or my strain gradient, my strain, if I take it and plug it into this equation, now is lambda minus, minus square root of lambda, minus square root of lambda, <coughs> the derivative of, I can do this guys, I promise, okay. The derivative of all these now, going over, the derivative of f, x with respect to y and y with respect to x is zero. So all the and similarly for the rest of these components, 
So now my strain is just out zero. Okay, cool. We got through one of the examples. So now this is the general strain in a body that's being uniaxially stretched. Um, in most materials, uh, what you would actually have is something, if I strain it some distance um, E1 in the one direction, you would then have a minus nu E1 minus nu uh, E1 in the other two directions. Do, do, do. This is for a uh, general linear elastic body that has some Poisson's ratio nu, but here this is a this is specifically for volume conserving bodies. So something like a rubber or cork where the Poisson's ratio here would be equal to 0 0.5. Uh, da, da, da. I'm going to leave the cap off because that is just going to cause me nothing but problems. Okay, let's see if we can do another example. Uh, and if I don't mess it up horribly like I did this one. So I'm going to go back to our pure strain problem because, or not pure strain, uh, simple strain, simple shear. I'm going to go back to our simple shear problem um, because it's very relevant and because there's some issues around it. So here, simple <coughs> shear. Do, 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 do. Now I have some body. I'm just going to look at the x and y this time. Uh, so the same equations apply for 2D and 3D systems. You just take out one of the all the z terms. If this initially starts off as some body here, and I deform it out like this, um, this has some gamma that I'm shearing <coughs> it out by. Now my u of x is equal to uh, the so my x direction is now dependent on my y if you remember our example from before so this is y tangent of gamma uh, this is now zeros or we don't need to do this for all the directions let's just do 2d y tangent of gamma zero which is approximately equal to uh, y gamma zero small strain. Now if I take this and use my strain function, the strain calculation that I had before, epsilon dux dx one half dux dy dy dx one half du x dy dy dx dy dy uh, that, this value is zero this value is zero now uh, du x dy is equal to gamma because I'm taking the derivative there this is equal to zero but then I also have the same thing now on the other side so this would be zero gamma over 2, gamma over 2, 0. So now we have a nice symmetric strain. Everything works out the way that we want it to for the strain. But if you look at the body, I'm the way that I'm deforming it, I'm just taking a shear over that way. So what is actually going on with this body? Why, if I'm, if I'm applying here, we, we remember this is our engineering definition of shear. If you, I'll, I'll bring this back up in a second, but if I have my some shear stress, this is equal to G gamma for engineering shear uh, strain, uh, strain and stress. So here now I have, even though I'm, I'm using this same simple definition for shear that I had used before, 
the shear that I'm actually getting in my the strain that I'm actually getting in my in my strain tensor is a gamma over two. So what might be going on here? That's another way we can visualize the deformation of this body. Right now you've got the origin of like, the bottom of the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gamma over 2 would be like if you centered it at the center. Yes. So, yes, you're on the right track. So the... For anybody who didn't hear that, the, I'm, I'm drawing my coordinate system in the wrong position. So what's actually happening here in this diagram is this body is straining kind of out like this. I'm going to draw this very exaggerated by some gamma over 2, gamma over 2, gamma over 2. And then I'm taking it and rotating it by some gamma over two. So this is now, when when you see this state of, of shear, what's actually happening in the body is there's some state of pure, pure shear strain that's then being rotated into this coordinate. Now, this subtle nuance here is the source of a lot of confusion uh, for finite element programs later on, which I'll show you. I killed a lot of time because it was going in circles, but hopefully we'll get to it today. Um, but so here, I'm going to have this epsilon x y, which is my my shear strain, is equal to gamma over two. So this is a shear strain is equal to a gamma over two, where gamma is engineering shear strain. I want to point this out now because this is later on when we talk about uh, the elasticity constitutive law modeling. This is a problem and it's going to be confusing and I don't have a good reason or the explanation for why it's confusing is this convention of defining things with as engineering shear or as just shear strain gets mixed up a lot, even in different in different textbooks and different finite element solvers. And which one somebody is using is sometimes very arbitrary, and you have to know which one they're using in order to figure out which shear strain you need to be talking about. So, with that confusing note, uh, we're going to move on and talk about other stuff. So. Um, now, we have a general definition for stress, the force balance on a body. We know about stress transformations and how those move around. We have a general definition <laughs> for shear based on the deformation of the body. So if you have some equation u defining the displacement of all points in a body, you can then use that u to calculate out a shear. Um, the question now is, from an engineering standpoint, how do those two relate? So now we get to constitutive equations. So let's do digitive equations. First, I want to get this down to a very simple level. So I'm going to look at elasticity. So the way that stress and strain relate is often very, very complicated because it's a simplification of the actual underlying physical processes that are going on in the material. Whether there's grain boundary sliding, whether there's uh, polymer reorientation, whether there's crack, uh, crack propagation and opening. So when we get these constitutive equations out, these are kind of simplifications of all of these complex physical processes that are happening in a body. Uh, the simplest of these simplifications is linear elasticity. So I'm going to go back and def redefine real quick um, definitions from elasticity. So uh, these are generally true. If I take a body, let's say initial width w, not 
initial length L naught, final length W, final length L. I can say I have some strain uh, <laughs> is L minus L naught over L naught. And uh, let's define a coordinate system now. I'm going to call this X and Y because I drew these rotated from where I should have. Epsilon X, Epsilon Y uh, is equal to W minus W naught over W naught. This, I'm applying some stress to the body sigma in a stress strain curve. Uh, at the very beginning of that stress strain curve, generally if it's a perfect body, you'll see some linear slope E, where this is now stress in the X, sigma in the X, and so the slope of the stress strain curve uh, E is equal to sigma over epsilon x for this is a Young's modulus modulus I can also define from this body a Poisson's ratio on some new is equal to minus epsilon y <coughs> over epsilon x this is a new uh, y x Sons ratio um, two to two. Jumping back, I had really quickly shown if I take some body two to two and deform it in shear, I apply some shear tau uh, and I deform it by some gamma there, then the relationship between these two. Um, I have some gamma, some tau, nope, gamma and gamma, gamma and tau. Here again, I'm going to assume that this is elastic. Um, this now, slope g is equal to tau over e, or tau over gamma. Uh, this again is, is our engineering shear strain. Um, which is how this is defined. Uh, da, da, da. This is engineering, shear, strain. Uh, what else? The if I take a compressible body, which most things are, do, do, do. I compress it to some smaller size by applying a whole bunch of pressure to it on all the sides uniformly, some P, then I can say I, I have a bulk modulus, K is equal to minus V dP dV. Um, side note, these this G is sometimes labeled as a mu. So if you ever see a mu in, in a textbook or somewhere, that mu and this g both refer to shear modulus. They get kind of used interchangeably depending on where you're looking. Um, sometimes g is used for other stuff, so people like to use mu instead. K can also sometimes be called b, just as a as a mental health warning. So again, if you if you sometimes these symbols are used interchangeably. Um, what else? Oh, Lemay's constant, which I actually found out how they derive it. So if I take a body between two fixed plates, and I apply some shear strain to it, some epsilon xx, as I apply this shear strain to it, the body is going to want to expand based on a Poisson's ratio expansion. So I'm going to need to apply a force. Some sigma y, y, here, here. Uh, so now the relationship between those two, my, the relationship between sigma y, y over epsilon x, x is known as 
Lemay, uh, Lemay is constant. I know, it's it's pretty lame, um, but so Lemay, the accent over the e, uh, French name. So uh, I had, I had brought this lambda or this uh, yeah lambda up before, and today we'll actually get to see where it comes up or why it's useful. So uh, the way that these all relate, there's some general relationships that are useful if I have them somewhere. Uh, I should. Oh, they're there. Okay. So, um, side note first. So these these are general definitions. So, no matter the isotropy of a body, this G. Um, so so like here, this epsilon x, the Young's modulus is true for any direction that you strain a material in. But now. What I'm going to say is, I'm going to focus on a very specific case of elasticity, which is isotropic elasticity. Which basically means, um, and I think Austin had had this question on the first day, wherever Austin is, um, but the, or the whatever day I talked about this, uh, what this means is my properties in every direction, <laughs> epsilon z, are all the same. So it doesn't matter what direction I rotate my material in, all of these elastic constants are the same in every direction. Kind of the same for nu xy is equal to nu xz is equal to nu yz is equal to some nu. Um, and, and similarly for every other property. So. This is our now special case of isotropic elasticity, which we pretend most materials are because it makes our lives easier. Um, some materials, like composite materials, are very anisotropic by design, and so there you have to start considering the anisotropic elasticity. Most materials technically are anisotropic, um, but I think we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. So with these isotropic elasticity relationships, I have, uh, there's a couple so those, those five constants, Poiss uh, Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, shear modulus, bulk modulus, and Lemay's constant, these all relate to each other. So if it's isotropic, you only need two of those to figure out the other three. Uh, there's, I'm just gonna write down some quick relationships, which I had given you before, but are still useful, so I'm gonna write them down again. Okay, equals E. One minus two nu, and lambda is nu e over one plus nu, one minus two nu. Hopefully those are all big enough for everyone to see. Um, so now I want to figure out for an arbitrary stress state on a body, what is the strain going to be for a linear elastic isotropic material? So what we can do is we can draw this down in a handy chart. Uh, so what is the strain for arbitrary airy stress? I can say I have some applied stress here. <coughs> and I want to know what the corresponding strain is in each given direction. So if I apply some sigma xx, you know that this body is going to stretch out based on that sigma xx. Uh, for isotropic elasticity, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stretch based on the Young's modulus. Here now, based on the Poisson's ratio, I have this is minus nu sigma xx over E minus nu sigma xx over E for sigma y and for sigma z I kind of have similar ones minus sigma y over E nu sigma y y over E uh, and the same for the rest of these I have these all written down somewhere in the notes that I'll scan 
um, for an applied applied shear, there's actually conveniently uh, no relationship between any of the other variables. So you have xy, uh, epsilon xy, epsilon xz, epsilon yz. So this now relates. This is this is my one over g sigma xy. So this is my my engineering shear stress strain relationship. But for all these other ones, there there actually is nothing. So if I if I shear the body, it doesn't cause a corresponding contraction in any other direction. Uh, and similarly, for uh, xz, this is one over g sigma xz, one over g sigma yz, and the rest of these are all zeros, uh, yz, which is convenient. So now I want to know how does that strain relate if I apply some arbitrary stress, um, some arbitrary stress state sigma, how, how do my strains in each direction change? So what I can do, I'm going to grab another piece of paper, just burning through papers today, um, is, I, is I'm actually just going to sum all of the values here. So if I, eh, maybe I don't even so if I sum the values of strain on this, sum these ones together, my epsilon xx <coughs> doesn't get affected by any of the shear strains at all, but it does get affected by these other ones. So the relationship between these I can write out as 1 over e sigma xx minus nu sigma yy plus sigma zz, which might look familiar to everyone for the 3D version of Hooke's Law? Yes. Possibly. Okay. So this is this is sort of well, sort of how you end up at a at a general definition of Hooke's Law. Uh, a few more minutes. Epsilon Y Y is similar, one over E sigma Y Y minus nu sigma X X plus sigma z z. Um, epsilon z z is similar. Uh, I'm not going to write it out. Uh, my epsilon x y is just 1 over g sigma x y and similar for epsilon x z, epsilon y z. Um, and all these, all these relationships are written down in the notes. So this is a little bit different than what we normally think of as our stress strain relationship. So for, for the 1D, 1D Hooke's law, I have sigma is E epsilon, which is kind of a gross simplification, but it works. But then what happens if I have an arbitrary strain state? How does that affect stress in a linear elastic isotropic material? Um, and so what I can do is take inverses of those. So I take inverses of all those epsilon xx, yy, uh, and I end up with some big, long, ugly equation. So this actually ends up at, for sigma xx, this is something like e epsilon xx over 1 plus nu. I'm not actually going to write out the math for you, but if you were to go through and, and calculate this out, this is sort of what you would end up at. Uh, nu e over 1 plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu, epsilon x, x plus epsilon y, y, epsilon z, z. So when you take that inverse, there's a whole bunch of kind of gross numbers that all pile up, it turns out uh, that there's a whole bunch of simplifications that you can make based on those relationships between the values. So this term actually ends up being 2g epsilon xx, and this term is now, oh, uh, 
this term is actually now my Lemay's constant. Hey, there it is, the Lemay's constant. Um, x, x, epsilon y, y, epsilon z, z. Sometimes this quantity is easier to call uh, the trace of my epsilon. Do people remember what the trace is from linear algebra? So if I have um, some matrix A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, um, the trace of A is just the sum of these diagonals equals A plus E plus I. So, whoop, let's move that over there. So the, the trace is kind of a, it, it doesn't come up too often because it's normally not super useful, but here it actually ends up being a nice way to represent this. So we can write this really simply, 2G epsilon XX plus lambda trace of epsilon. So now this big, long, ugly equation kind of becomes something nice and clean uh, for our inverse. So you could write that out for all the rest of the sigmas. Um, and for my shear stress, this is now G epsilon X, uh, G gamma X, Y. Um, okay. I'll talk about tomorrow a more general formulation for this. And we'll talk about the stress and strain, the stiffness tensor and the compliance tensor, which are the generalized form of Hooke's law in 3D. All right. See you guys.